Most moviegoers don't go out of their way to watch terrible movies, do they? But at the same time, they'll usually freely admit when they've accidentally ended up watching a bit of a dud. And yet sometimes, the collective audience denial is overpowering enough that viewers en masse will only actually fully admit that a movie was trash a good while later. For a ton of different and often quite understandable reasons, audiences just didn't want to face up to the fact that the following 10 movies weren't merely disappointing, they utterly sucked. So I'm Gareth, this is What Culture, and here are 10 movies nobody wants to admit suck. Number 10, The Matrix Resurrections. Just about every fan of the Matrix franchise desperately wanted to love the belated fourth entry, didn't they? Even if most knew deep down that it surely wouldn't be a patch on that statuesque original. As it turned out though, The Matrix Resurrections couldn't even hold a candle to the just pretty good sequel or even the wildly divisive third. With Lana Wachowski turning in one of cinema's all-time great instances of a creative firebombing their own IP with seemingly intentional abandon. Though the sequel's meta flourishes begin promisingly enough, this is ultimately self-aware to a fault because the film spends way too long hand-wringing over its own pointlessness than, well, just getting to the point. Beyond that, the story is just abject nonsense. And most disappointingly, the visuals are shockingly lackluster for a Matrix film, with specifically the fight scenes just being a bit forgettable and bland. The magic just wasn't there this time, sadly. And while an initial viewing of The Matrix Resurrections was bewildering enough that fans just needed a minute there to process it, a few years after the fact, it's much easier to admit now that the film was just a bit naff. Number 9, Clerks 3. Not unlike the fourth Matrix, the third Clerks movie was such a long gestating affair that many fans were willing to overlook some serious issues because the film had just actually got made. They were like, yeah, it's here, finally. Kevin Smith's apparently final entry into the slacker comedy series series coasted hard on doo-eyed nostalgia for the prior films. But once it was all said and done, the end result was a profoundly empty and oddly depressing experience. For starters, the film is bookended by two wildly divisive and questionable character deaths, clearly motivated by Smith's own near-fatal heart attack in 2018, and yet casting a hugely dark cloud over a threequel that was in desperate need of a few laughs, really. Elsewhere, the film's relentless shilling of NFTs has already aged pretty badly since the film released, and it's only gonna get worse and worse as time goes by, isn't it? And while Clerks 3 will probably wring a few tears for those who are dedicated fans of the series and the franchise and all that good stuff, that still doesn't necessarily make it a great movie. As wonderfully off the cuff as the first two movies were, this one just feels like a bit of a forced victory lap that gets a bit too serious for its own good. A reality many fans are still struggling to accept in lieu of its rather shocking ending. Number 8, Blue Beetle. Now to be completely fair to Blue Beetle, it's far from the worst film that's ever popped up in the DCEU. But let's be honest, with that statement, we're quite comfortably setting the bar all the way down in hell. By far the most interesting thing about Blue Beetle is the fact it's the first major superhero live action movie with a Latino lead. Because outside its laudable representation, it's pretty much just another generic paint by numbers superhero cape flick. To put it simply, it doesn't really bring anything new to the table, does it? The plot, characters, and dialogue all feel largely boilerplate. Susan Sarandon gives such a snoozy performance as the lame duck villain that she was lucky to avoid a Razzie. And it's directed with little flair beyond being basically functional. In many respects, The Blue Beetle was the little superhero movie that could in 2023. A scrappier, lower budget superhero movie that people actually wanted to be good. Yet in retrospect, it's painfully obvious now why Warner Brothers were initially considering sending this one straight onto streaming. Number seven, Warcraft. Of all the epic video game franchises to adapt into a movie, Warcraft certainly seemed like one one that was absolutely overflowing with potential because it was such a, a deep world and it had so many fans, it was so popular. But once you get over the undeniably impressive CGI and visual effects that are seen going down within this movie within like the first 10 minutes, the mask slips a bit and Warcraft just reveals itself to be yet another soulless, mega budgeted flick that's just trying its best to be the next Lord of the Rings. Much as many fans might swear that Warcraft wasn't really that bad, no, 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 Warcraft was actually that bad. Beyond its yawn inducingly formulated plot, Warcraft is packed full of tiresome expository dialogue. The practical sets also look a little bit cheap, don't they? And the film somehow managed to coax a bad performance out of Ben Foster. I mean, I, I don't even know how you do that. That's crazy. Warcraft was so intent on laying the track for a new franchise that it forgot to make a single interesting movie first. And while many continue to bang the drum for this Warcraft adventure, the fact that it underperformed at the box office suggests that even few among the die-hard fandom truly vibed with it. 
number six, Lightyear. Even with the lower batting average in recent years, Pixar is still one of the greatest animation studios of all time, isn't it? And it's never fun to come to terms with the fact that they've released yet another bad movie that isn't Cars 2. And on paper, it genuinely felt like Lightyear just couldn't miss. A Toy Story spin-off that primed to serve as a campy throwback to classic sci-fi adventures like Flash Gordon. Except that wasn't really the movie that Pixar decided to make. Given that Lightyear is supposed to be the very movie that Andy watched all the way back in 1995 and inspired him to buy that toy or at least ask for that toy as a present, it's bizarre that it's relatively serious and, and not really that much fun and a bit boring at times. It's simply tough to come away from this movie and appreciate why Andy, or any other kid for that matter, would have ever fallen in love with it. Not even Pixar's signature visual flair can save this light year. It's a bafflingly pedestrian adjunct to the studio's flagship franchise, and one that's made infinitely worse by that divisive twist. Number 5, Rustin. Blockbusters and franchise movies are one thing, but what about well-intended Oscars bait that also just misses the mark a little bit? In the current awards cycle, there's no bigger example of that than Rustin. This is a biopic of civil rights activist Bynard Rustin. And were it not for Coleman Domingo's Oscar-nominated performance in the lead role, which, while decent, is a little bit restricted by the bland script, this particular film probably would have been forgotten instantly. Rustin is a quintessential Wikipedia page biopic, a by-the-numbers checklist-ticking exercise that's painfully lacking in soul or personality, no matter how well Domingo does in the lead role. The script is an expository barrage of information, yet doesn't really outline who Rustin was as a human being. And even its depiction of the 1963 March on Washington feels weirdly small and low-key, though that was presumably hampered by a low-ish budget. Given that the film is spotlighting an important story centred around an underrepresented figure in history, nobody really wants to admit that it's bad. But once Oscar season passes, it'll be a lot easier to admit that, Domingo aside, Rustin was pretty lousy, to be honest. Number 4, It Chapter 2. The first chapter of Andy Muschietti's adaptation of Stephen King's classic horror tome, It, was such a pleasant surprise, fans approached the sequel with fair confidence that Muschietti would once again knock it out of the park. Because why wouldn't he? With a note-perfect cast playing the older versions of the Loser Club, including Jessica Chastain, James McAvoy, Bill Hader, and James Ranson. It seemed like all the necessary ingredients were there for Muschietti to just finish off this story in a great way. But It Chapter 2 actually feels less a satisfying conclusion to this overall story, more a vocal warning about the dangers of letting a successful filmmaker run amok. With a budget almost double that of It Chapter 1, this sequel was a 169 minute bloated mishmash of CGI driven set pieces. And most of those set pieces just largely felt like warmed over rehashes of what worked so well in the first film. Sure, the cast commits gamely to the material, but the film's tedious fetch quest plot does them no favours at all. Chapter 1 was such a mesmerising adaptation that nobody really wanted to admit that Muschietti had fumbled the ball with the second half, even though he categorically did, sadly. Number 3, Ready Player One Though Ready Player One received broadly positive reviews when it released all those years ago, it's also a film whose shine wore off incredibly quickly too, as not even Steven Spielberg's directorial ingenuity could disguise its overpowering hollowness for too long. Some might dub it a high-calorie, switch-your-brain-off kind of movie, but its core is so empty and emblematic of Hollywood's worst current instincts it's pretty tough to just accept this as dumb fun. A garish crash of pop culture references may very much be the point of Ernest Cline's source novel, but does it a good movie or even a good story make? Certainly not, and for all the craft that clearly went into making it, Ready Player One's a resoundingly barren endeavour. One that evacuates itself from your mind very quickly and doesn't give you much of a reason to go back and revisit it either. It isn't easy to face up to the fact that Spielberg, of all people, made a movie that was so devoid of soul, but here we are. Number 2, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny The fact so many people begin their assessment of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny by calling it, well, better than the last one, says it all, really. Every card-carrying indie fan, myself included, desperately wanted this James Mangold swan song to give Indiana Jones the exciting and dignified ride off into the sunset that he deserved. But the end result was a depressingly anodyne and seriously overlong slog. So much of the movie is focused on just how miserable Indy's 
life has become. A fact only compounded when we learn of the grim fate that befell his son, Mutt. Did many Indiana Jones fans come to see this movie to see a meditation on grief? I know I didn't. Making Indy a bereaved, depressed, and separated alcoholic didn't exactly lay the groundwork for another rip-roaring adventure, did it? Yet even the high wire set pieces that were present lacked the weight and intensity of the original trilogy. Were it not for Ford's game presence and a pretty nutty third act twist, it'd be pretty tough to rank this one that much higher than Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. As it stands, it settles for the decisive fourth place in the franchise. And when it comes to revisiting the series, are any fans honestly really going to bother with any movie that's not a part of the original trilogy? The Dial of Destiny may have left Indy in a rather good place, but didn't the franchise already do that like 30 years ago? Yes, yes it did, Junior. Number one, World War Z. There's an almost impressive denial that Mark Foster's adaptation of World War Z isn't a bad movie. As if its infamously troubled shoot indicated such an atrocious end product that it being merely bad in the end was a bit of a solid outcome? Brilliant though Max Brooks' source novel actually is. This adaptation in name only takes the book's branding to sell a shambolically by the numbers zombie actioner. One that's filled with inane dialogue and limply directed PG-13 violence. It certainly sounds like Paramount were cooking up a decidedly more daring film at one point, before they decided to scrap the entire third act and replace it with the safer slot that we got in the end. But all the same, this is maddeningly dull for a $200 million blockbuster about Brad Pitt fighting the undead. That a sequel still hasn't materialised despite the fact that this movie somehow managed to gross $540 million worldwide, perhaps speaks to how utterly beige and forgettable World War Z actually was from start to finish. Much as fans of the book above all others don't want to admit it. But whatever brings them joy, I guess. Bye-bye!